Welcome to your intended message, the perfect place for leaders and promising professionals who want to convey the intended message for greater success. Every week, we interview experts who can help you communicate more effectively, whether that's one-to-one, one-to-few, or one-to-many, and perhaps the most important conversation, one-to-self. I'm your host, George Tora. My guest today is Michael Haig. Here's three facts that I think you should know about Michael. Number one, his most exciting and f- f- fulfilling Hollywood experience was the first time that he met with Will Smith and his wife, Jada Pinkett Smith, at their mansion to coach them on a script that they were working on. Two, He has a 90-minute live interview on YouTube that's seen over a half a million views where he talks about story structure. And three, apparently the best job he ever had was as a department store Santa Claus. Michael Haig, welcome to your intended message. Thanks. Great to be here. You know, those sounded like such good things to provide you with (laughs) Now they're kind of making me laugh. Oh, yeah. Especially the last one, because the last one is for sure true. And, and, and it's, yeah, we all, we all have those uh, jobs that weren't necessarily our career highlight, but they were still fun to have. And, and I suppose the other thing that'd be important to tell you about Michael is that he is the author of uh, a few books, and this one in particular, Storytelling Made Easy. See, Michael is a Hollywood storyteller. He's a scriptwriter for Hollywood, and he's learned how to transform what Hollywood scriptwriters know to help business leaders tell their stories. Michael, why do business leaders, sales, sales reps, business leaders, managers, CEOs, why do they need to tell more stories? Well, There's a few different reasons, but the very core one is this, that a great story has as its primary objective to create an emotional experience. If you want to be a good speaker, presenter, sales exec, entrepreneur, if you want to make, uh, you know, uh, webinars, if you want to, if you're marketing a product, whatever, the way you persuade anyone to take action is, first of all, to get them to feel something because we ultimately make decisions emotionally. They may be backed up by logic and data and you know, discussions and things written on a piece of paper and so on, but ultimately we believe that whatever we're gonna spend money on to solve our problem is going to solve that problem or make us feel better. So if your goal is to do that, stories are the most powerful way you can create an emotional experience for someone that is an audience member or a reader of what you're writing, your prospect or your subject or whoever. And more than any place in the world, the, the sort of the, what I call the, the emotion picture capital of the world is Hollywood because that's what Hollywood has been doing for more than a century. And they are like masters of creating stories that elicit emotion in an audience. So if you can take those principles that Hollywood uses to create that emotional experience, to captivate an audience or to captivate a reader, and you apply those to the stories you're using for business, those are gonna become the most powerful stories that your prospects hear. And those are the most likely to persuade them to take what action you want them to take. Michael, when it comes to creating that emotional experience, does it matter what emotion we tap into? Um, Yeah, well, you don't want want to tap into boredom. (laughs) That's, That's an emotion you probably want to avoid. Well, you think about movies. I mean, it's the same thing. The emotion is what we want to do. What you need to do as a storyteller is you need to create a subconscious connection between your audience or your reader 
and whoever the main character of your story is. Because if you think about going to movies or watching television, when we, when we go to a movie, it's not just, we don't go to movies because they're interesting. We go to movies because we become the hero of that story. And so if you're watching Titanic, we psychologically or subconsciously become Rose as she falls in love with Jack and battles the sinking ship and tries to get to New York, et cetera, et cetera. So it's that deep empathy with the character that you need to create. And then what you want to do is take us, the viewer, the reader of the story on an emotional experience as that person. Okay, so we experience stories when you use Hollywood principles. We don't just hear them and say, mm, well, that's interesting, or, you know, I get your point or whatever. We, we need to feel something. And so the emotions you want to engender are the same ones the movies do. You want to excite people. You want to inspire people. You want to make them laugh. You occasionally want to make them cry. You want to get them scared or worried or or you want to ultimately make them feel victorious so you're primarily going to be telling stories about yourself or about people who've been guided by you who have succeeded who have crossed the finish line and won whatever they were pursuing because then whoever is hearing or reading this story has the emotional experience of winning by following whatever it is you're prescribing, because they've identified with the character who goes through that same journey. Now, I think of uh, Lord of the Rings. So does that mean that we, we all see ourselves as Frodo? Yep, that's exactly what it means. We, we, it's, it's more than we see ourselves, we become that character. So we, whatever's happening to Frodo and whatever Frodo is doing, we are doing, it's happening to us. And that's why stories are, whatever the arena, are so compelling and so captivating, because that emotional experience is going to be what touches us most deeply and becomes most persuasive in you know, getting us to take action, whether it's to buy a product or, or to hire you as a coach or hire you to be a speaker or be inspired by what you say to go off and change our lives in some way. I'm guessing in order to create that emotional experience, the story needs to be more than a simple narration. Yeah, well, I mean, there are certain key things a story has to have. It, 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 it's, yeah, it's, you said it right. It's more than narration. I mean, for a story to work, first of all, there has to be a hero. There has to be a character. Sometimes there could be more than one, but a, a, a primary character, a main character, protagonist, who, whose, whose pursuit, whose journey is what the story is about. Now, when I say there has to be a hero, my, the term hero in this context does not mean someone who's heroic. It generally means someone who is an everyday person, or at the very least, even if they're in an extraordinary situation, they have everyday fears or problems and so on that they have to overcome. And so the story is not about they're a hero at the beginning, it's about them becoming a hero through the course of the story and finding the skill and the courage to be able to achieve whatever the goal of the hero is in the story. So you've got to have a hero. You've got to create empathy with that character. So we do identify. So we do become that character psychologically. So you do that by getting us to feel sorry for the character or perhaps by putting the character in jeopardy. So we're worried about them or by making them kind and good hearted or generous because we like those characters. And those are the people we want to become psychologically. All of this is subconscious, not all of it, but, but the effect is subconscious in a lot of ways. Okay, and then the next thing is you have to give that character a goal. And this is, this is really extremely simple, but it's also extremely difficult. It's one of the hardest things to kind of master, even though it sounds easy, and that is to realize that stories are, now, are not just about characters in situations, or they're not just about a series of events that happen to a character. Stories, really powerful stories, are about characters who desperately want something or desperately need something, and the story is about them pursuing that particular goal. 
and all the obstacles that they face in doing it. Because the next thing the story needs is they're pursuing that goal is there must be conflict. If the goal is to elicit emotion, there have to be obstacles for that character to overcome. Both external obstacles, you know, like uh, a villain in a movie or, or competitors, uh, if it's a story about that, or it could be external con conflict from nature, you know, a medical condition or a, a weather pattern, or whatever it might be. Pandemic. Or it could be, or could be inner conflict, the fears and the wounds we carry around, they're going to stop us from doing what we need to. But if the goal is to elicit emotion, emotion grows out of conflict, not the desire. And the bigger the conflict, the more involving the story is. And then finally, there also has to be transformation. By the end of the story, the hero, the hero's circumstances have to have changed. They either achieved the goal, they got the brass ring, or they didn't. And in the deeper stories, the stories that are most powerful, generally speaking, the hero has changed internally as well. They are now more courageous than they were before. They have now learned something and grown as a person. So it's so those are all elements of good narration, but it's not, as you say, what I took your question to mean is, is it just about telling us things that happen? And no, it's not. You can do that, but that won't be powerful. That won't be persuasive. So how does one take, um, if, if one has a, a story, perhaps a story, an incident, and how does one go from simply narrating this happened and then that happened and then that happened and that, you know, which, which was probably a boring story. How does one go from there to a story that, that creates empathy and, and conflict and, and brings people in? Well, the first thing is to go back and look at the story you've come up with and ask yourself, does it have those elements I just listed? Because lots of times we will think, uh, you know, something will happen to us and we think, well, that was funny or that was interesting. Interesting doesn't really cut it. Stories can be interesting, but if that's all there is, but does it it, first of all, is it a story about something from your life or someone you guided, a client or, or patient or purchaser of your product? Is it about someone who really had a problem they had to solve, the, who had a real goal that they had to achieve in the face of some difficulty, in the face of some problem? So let's say you're a financial advisor, okay? Then saying, telling us a story about all the things you learned in business school Okay, sure, but why? Why? What has that got to do with me? But if, as a financial advisor, you help somebody who had just inherited a hundred thousand dollars and didn't have any idea what to do with it, now you have a person with a problem. They have a goal. What do I to to invest this wisely? And you worked with them and took them on that journey as the guide. And now, what happens is when we hear that story, subconsciously we become your client that you talked about, and we're thinking, yeah. I want to work with you like I just got to subconsciously, because clearly from that story, you were able to help them and they had a problem similar to mine, because I also have the goal of investing my money or whatever it might be. Okay, so that's the first thing. Go back to the story and say, was there really a goal? And then ask yourself, okay, were, was it a difficult goal to achieve? Were there really obstacles you had to overcome? And then what you do is, you, you break that down into a sequence of events that are going to build that emotion and take the hero on a kind of a prescribed journey. This is also where my experience in Hollywood is. I, I, I was never actually a screenwriter. That wasn't my career. I, I'm a script consultant. So I was always helping writers or producers or movie stars or directors or, or studios, whatever helping them take the stories they had and make them as emotionally involving and commercially successful as possible. Okay, but what I learned in Hollywood among many other things or what I developed was there's a real formula, if you will. There's a, there's a structure that stories follow, whether they're movie stories or business stories or whatever. And you need to know what that is. Um, uh, what I, 
when I did the book you held up, uh, Storytelling Made Easy, I took those movie principles and I streamlined them and molded them into something that would be of helpful to say public speakers or anyone giving presentations from the stage or on Zoom nowadays or whatever. And so I laid out a, a, a kind of a six step, not kind of, it's a six step story structure. I call it the six step success story. And it just defines what the six steps are that you wanna take the hero of your story through. Either the six steps you went through to achieve the goal or the six steps someone who you helped or who inspired you, if it's like a story about a mentor who, who taught you a lot. And you wanna be sure you follow those. And if you, do, if you do that, now you know you've got a story with a goal, you know who the hero is and it's going to follow the proper structure. And then from then on, now you start developing the story in terms of how, how do you describe the situation? What dialogue do you add? What are the specifics? How do you, how do you what, what of all the obstacles do you choose and so on? But the starting point is first of all, do you actually have a story? Now, one thing I would add is uh, one, of the, one of the difficulties people express when I talk to them about story, they're resistive to storytelling from the stage, let's say. And that is because they think, A, nobody would want to hear a story from me because I have nobody important. I haven't done anything special. And B, I either don't have any stories to tell or I wouldn't know what stories to tell, okay? But those are actually not hard to overcome at all. The reason you got to get rid of this idea, nothing special happened to me, is that's not what we look for in stories. If we're in the audience, we don't want all the stories we hear to be about, you know, being an astronaut or climbing a mountain, okay? All we want to hear are stories where we identify with the difficulties and the desires of the character. So, so that's when that inner thing comes along because we've all felt like we're not good enough. We all feel at times like we're alone, like, like we're gonna be humiliated. We all feel like um, you know, we, we have to prove ourselves or, or, or we long for acceptance and things like that. So when you tell stories, no matter what the arena that someone has those experiences, if you go for that, then you don't need to worry about, you know, being, you know, a major superstar or celebrity. In fact, if you think about Hollywood movies, almost all Hollywood movies, fictional or true, are about people, unless they're legendary in some way, who are everyday people who then witness a murder or fall in love or get approached by or, you know, chased by a serial killer or whatever. So that's, that's the answer to that. And as far as not having stories to tell, all you want to ask yourself is, what in my life have I ever accomplished that was difficult? If you can name something that you accomplished and it wasn't easy to accomplish it, but it, but it has a visible finish line that you, you achieved, you, you, know, uh, you got a standing ovation from a speech, okay? If that was difficult, then I don't know anybody that that wouldn't be difficult for, now you got a story because you have a hero, you have a goal, and it's got conflict. And so that's where you look, is what have I done or what have I helped other people do to overcome obstacles and achieve a, a goal that was important to that person, not necessarily important to your audience. You could have a great story about someone who has, uh, who's illiterate or let's say dyslexic and have a great deal of problem. And so their goal was just to be able to read a book just read one book. Well, that isn't a big obstacle for most of us, but we'll identify with that person because they had those obstacles to overcome. So I'm hearing that we, the listener, identify with the story, not necessarily because we identify with the, the situation or the circumstances, but we identify with the feelings of that person as they struggle. Yes, exactly. Now, if you're trying to persuade somebody in, in, in a sort of a marketing context, stories are what I call kind of stealth marketing. So if you are a speaking coach, let's say, okay, now there are reasons that you might want to tell a story about uh, a childhood uh, 
accomplishment you had or some other thing that have nothing to do with that. But you definitely want stories that relate to your target audience's goal, which is to give a good speech. So it's not like you just want to, you know, tell a lot of sports stories about when you were a letterman on the high school baseball team. It's you do want to zero in on that, but they don't all have to be that way. Because if you have stories where you learned a core principle that you live by or work by, we need to know that as well. We need to know not just that you're an expert or that you have experience in the field that might help me, but we need to know, can we trust you? Are you, you know, will you do what you say? Or are, are, do we like you? Uh, do you feel like you understand us in terms of not just the facts you know, but in the way you work with people? So you, yes, it doesn't, they don't all have to be just about one particular area, even if you're talking to that particular group. Now, Michael, when you work with, when you work with people and you help them, create and tell their story what's the process that you go through well um it's it's really the same process i've been going through for decades including when i was in hollywood or if i was coaching will smith and that is first of all i need to know what the story is you've got in mind so i would if if you're a screenwriter, I would need to see uh, either a, a completed screenplay and you want me to help you rewrite it, or I would need to hear or see an outline or a treatment or one page or a blurb or something. You have to tell me something about the story that you have in mind so we could work with that. Okay, if you want to be a speaker, I would ask to either, usually if it's a speaker who has an idea, I ask them to do a video, tell the speech on a, a video so I can look at it being presented. And then we go from there. Whatever it is, once I've seen it, and then we set up a meeting, then I just start talking to them. And that conversation begins with a lot of questions that I'm asking them because Michael, I need Michael, to know. I'm, in, I'm, I'm gonna interrupt here because I, I'm intrigued by what you're saying. And I'm wondering, instead of telling us what you do, maybe you can show us what you do. And, and let's play with me. Maybe there's a story uh, we can work on here that, that, that I can yeah, put Great. On. I'd love to do that. That's, that that's my sense. favorite thing to do. So, so, so let's what go. Do start? What, what do I do first? Well, as I said, first of all, you need to be thinking about something you... Let's, let's narrow it down a bit. Let's say it's going to be an autobiographical story. Okay, because you're going to want an arsenal that has both stories with you as the hero and stories with satisfied customers or clients as the hero. Let's just stay with the autobiographical. So you need to look at your past and think of any time in your past where you accomplished a goal that was very difficult, but you were able to achieve that. So is there something like that that comes to mind that you could, you know, build on or that we could start working with? Well, Mike, I'm Michael. I'm I'm uh, proud of uh, the radio show that I hosted for 19 years, and why I'm proud of that is because I had absolutely no training as a journalist or in radio. It was a volunteer, uh, a volunteer position at community radio, and I and I reached out to interview people, and I started with. Uh, well, I could, you know, I could speak, I could talk, I, I could talk, uh, and I was presenting to audiences, but being on radio was, was different. I had to learn a whole new set of skills and uh, grow as a person. I had to develop. So, so I'm certainly proud of, of the accomplishments I made there, and, and, I, and I certainly ran into challenges uh, with, uh, with some of the people I was interviewing. I was, uh, uh, because I, I thought myself as smaller than the people I was interviewing. Okay, so the first thing I would say is, uh, and you're, you've already started doing it. If you say, well, one of your greatest accomplishments was 19 years as a, a radio host, a radio interviewer, or with your own radio show. Okay, well, that was difficult and that was a goal but what that goal lacks is a couple things. One, it doesn't have a clearly defined finish line. In other words, there wasn't, you could say, well, for 19 years, I wanted to just get better and better. But the goal you need for a good story is something that not only is fine, that has a, 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 an end point. So you can say, I did it, I won, 
But when you say what that goal is, whoever hears that desire you had can picture what achieving it would look like. Okay, so when you, let's just say it said, so I want to tell a story about becoming, you know, a very successful radio host over 19 years. Okay, I don't know what that really looks like. I mean, I can picture you in a radio booth, but I don't know what it means to be successful. Are you successful when you get 100 people to tune in? Or are you successful when you learn how to, you know, turn up the micro? There's no, there's no specific thing. So what I would do to avoid those two issues, and also anything that takes 19 years is going to become episodic. It's going to be, well, first I did this, and oh, then there was the day I did this. So now what you want to do is take all those episodes and look, look at all of them or make a list of all the difficult things you had to do and pick one and just talk about one particular goal within that job. So was it was the goal to get get hired? You had to somehow prove to somebody you could do it. That would have been a goal because getting hired for a job, I can picture that. It's like, here you go. You're hired. Shake your hand. And that's now we know, OK, this is what we're rooting for you to do. Or would it be, um, you know, a particular show you did or whatever? So, so I guess my question is, so was there anything in those 19 years that you uh, wanted or needed to accomplish that wasn't easy for you to do, but got you to some end point? One of the, one of the challenges and goals was to be more comfortable talking with people who I imagined were above my pay grade. Okay. Because I thought of them as better people than me. Okay. So what you want to do, because what you just described now is the conflict. Okay. So you want to tell a story where one of the obstacles you had to overcome is your feeling of, inadequacy or, or uh, you know, lower class, whatever that was. But, but getting rid of something is not a very effective goal. So not being nervous. It's like having this story about not drinking or not, you know, or not having this ha habit or whatever. That, because whatever you want to avoid doing, you could always start doing it again the next day. What you need to do is think of, okay, well, what was one of the interviews where you had this feeling and it was a struggle to overcome that feeling, but you found a way to do it by having it by through that interview or what you learned about yourself or about the process through getting that one interview that would, uh, that would show how you grew how, and, and be instructive of how you overcame whatever this self-doubt was. So can you pick one of those interviews you did where you really felt like I'm not in this person's league? Uh, definitely. The, uh, the first time I, I interviewed an author, uh, I, I was in awe of authors. <laughs> and, and I did it at, uh, at her, uh, um, her office in an in office tower downtown Toronto. Uh, everything about the, the building was uh, just overwhelming me. <laughs> Okay, cool. Can, are, are we going to get specific? Can you name who it was or do you want to just make it generic? Or uh, want to call her Joan Smith and we'll, we won't say. Um, the author, um, not quite so well known anymore. She uh, was an e economist of all things. Her name was Nula Beck. She wrote a book called Shifting Gears about the changing economy. And I quite, the book resonated with me. Okay, let, let me stop you there. Okay, the story will be a lot stronger if you tell us that, because now it's a specific person. We know why it was that you wanted to interview her. It doesn't matter if we've, uh, if we've heard of Nola Beck or not. It's just that to you, she was important because a story where you say, you know, I wanted to interview somebody. If, here's two stories. I want to interview somebody famous versus I really want to interview Nola Beck, a top economist who'd written a book that I greatly admired. Now, which story sounds just instinctively, this is going to be more fun. Gotcha. Because, yeah. because your job as a storyteller, among other things, is to transport us into the world that you occupied at that time. So if it's a specific person in a specific place that wrote a specific book, 
that that's fine. It doesn't matter that if nobody listening to this podcast has ever heard of her, that doesn't matter. All that matters is you really wanted her, wanted to get this interview. Now, one other thing. So your goal was to get this interview. Was there a specific thing that you wanted to happen during that interview? In other words, I get that you're giving an interview, but was there something you said to yourself, if I could just get Nola back to X, or if, if in this interview, she will explain this. In other words, I, what I'm asking is, okay, you want to interview her, you will, it'll be whatever it is, but how do you know it's gonna, how will you know it's a good interview? How will you know you've succeeded at it being good? And, and it could be that it would be good if you just never stammered or didn't faint. <laughs> Okay, but is there something you really wanted her to say or you to be able to bring out of that interview? I probably wanted to, I probably wanted to come across as, as sounding intelligent, <laughs> as having some understanding of what she was doing. And, and, and I, I, I suppose I would want, uh, have wanted her to appreciate that I had read her book and uh, enjoyed it and understood it. I think that's what I was look, really looking okay, for. Okay, cool. Okay, good. So now, now we have a goal. You want to give an interview with her, or you want to have her give you an interview where you're not only finished the interview, but in the course of the interview, she realizes how much you meant to her and that you read and understood her book. Okay, cool. So now what you need to do to tell the story is, we know what the end point is, we know you are. Now you need to give us an idea of the steps. Now you're not going to recreate the entire interview, but now you want to go back and look for details such as, okay, how did, how did she even come to be a guest? Was part of the journey for you to somehow track down this woman you'd read this book by? I mean, I don't know if she was scheduled and then you read her book or you read her book and said, I want to get her. So if part of the journey was I've got to find the guts to somehow track her down and persuade her to even be on my show, then that's, that's part of the, one of the steps you go through. That's, that's part of your pursuit. And that has obstacles because getting somebody to say yes to an interview is not always easy, especially if you feel like, you know, I'm nobody because it sounds like you were sort of thinking that was your, I'm, you know, imposter syndrome point at that point. Okay, so you do that. And then when you, so you, we want to see how it led to that. So, so to go through those six steps, like the setup is we need to meet you before you had the, uh, before this even came about. You just say, I had only been working at this radio station for six months or two years or whatever. And I was still getting my feet wet. I felt like I still hadn't had any great interview or I, I'd made a bunch of fumbles, you know, but then I got, then I found out that Nola Beck was going to be in town, or then I came across this book that I thought was great or whatever, or my boss came in and said, look, we want to interview Nola Beck. I, I'm just making these up, but you'll figure it out. That's your crisis. This new opportunity has been giving you. So now you've got a researcher and you've got to persuade her to come, or you've got to set up what that's going to be. And then you go into the interview. Now, when you do that, what you want to do is, is transport us into not just telling us what happened, but into the setting. So you need to describe where were you when you heard this? Was did you have an office somewhere as a you know, apart from the studio? Or were you all, all the time in the studio? Or did you get a phone call at home? And when you get to the interview, what did this studio look like? Or what and, and what did you have to do? And tell us a little bit about what that involves so we can feel like we're there. And then when you, now you need to get into the, to the interview. And one of the things that might work here is you, we, you could use as dialogue your self-talk and, and, or you could say, oh, the night before, I, I couldn't even sleep. I just kept thinking, should I ask her this or should I ask her that? All of this anticipation all of this struggle. So you keep emphasizing how nervous you were about doing that. And then if you go into the interview and the first question doesn't really go very well, now I don't know if that's the case, but that isn't a bad thing either because that means, uh-oh, now you're in more trouble, but then you redeem yourself by asking this. And then what you wanna do 
is think of a moment in the interview where she responded to one of your comments or questions in a way that made it very clear, wow, you really read this book, or wow, you know, most people don't understand that. I, I did an interview, the first time I interviewed, uh, uh, let's make it all about me, okay? But just, it occurs to me that there was this great, the, that I was asked when I first went to film school, at, at this little film school, and the school would bring in all these movie stars and people, and there was one movie actor that many people listening may not remember who he is, his name's Richard Benjamin. And he was the star of a movie called Goodbye Columbus. And my favorite was The Last of Sheila and so on. So the, the guy who was director of the school who normally would do those interviews in front of big audiences was tied up and he asked if I would. And I just, I thought, oh no, I don't know. Am I gonna? And I fretted and I thought, I don't know. And finally I just decided, well, I have seen every one of the guy's movies. So I interviewed Richard Benjamin. There were about 150 people in the audience, which made me very nervous. And at one point I, I asked him something like, what do you do when you're acting in a movie somebody and you really don't like them? <laughs> what do you do? And so he, he turned to the audience and he says, why doesn't anybody else ask me questions like this? These are the kind of things you really need to know. And I was just like, there, there was it. So that was that kind of moment. So if you could find a moment like that with her, that's the climax of your story. Ah, powerful. And you, when it, I have a motto, and that is when you're telling stories for business, let's say, or to inspire you, you know, they have to be, they have to be true, okay? but they don't have to be factual. <laughs> In other words, you can't say, and, and uh, you know, she and I ran away together and lived happily ever after if that didn't really happen. That would be, or I got a huge bonus if you didn't. But if she clearly connected with you or said it in some way, and you need to sharpen her dialogue in just a way that conveys it more clearly without making it artificial, without, without, without being, you know, like pulling the wool over people's eyes. You don't wanna be a snake oil salesman, but you do, you can modify some of these things for the better story. And the last thing is, uh, the, the last step of the six steps I talk about is what I call the aftermath. And what we want to see is like, if she says something that really, uh, really, uh, that I just described is that finish line moment that you can, you're thinking to yourself, I did it. She really, she really connected with me or we really connected. You don't want to end the story there. Although this is, this is a difficulty lots of people telling stories do. That's not the end of the story. That's just the climax of the story. We need to then learn what is what was the new life you were able to live or what is the new life you're living now as a result of going on that journey, as a result of finding the courage to really bring her in and do the prep and whatever it was that you had to overcome to do that. And so that's the aftermath. It's like if go to movies again, you'll see very seldom does a movie end just when they blow away the serial killer, <laughs> or just even in a even in Karate Kid, um, which a, a script I I consulted on, by the way, the newer one. But even then, even though it's very short, we get to see after Daniel wins, he gets hugged by his mom, and then he and Mr. Han have this big embrace, and we realize they've both grown from this, and they're both going to be completely and and that that feeling is one you want to engender. And if you're doing it for work, what you want to be sure is that the, uh, the aftermath of your story is a life that your followers, that your prospects would like to be living. Not specifically. I mean, if you tell a story and, and the, you know, after you made X amount of money, you bought a, a beach cabin and other people don't care about that, but it represents independence and wealth and so on. And so for you, one of the things after you dig into this or as you're working on it, you just want to say, what, why is this story going to be not just emotional, but of value to people? But you are, you, you, you coach presenters, correct? Okay, right. so if you were to tell this, and in the course of doing this, you learned a technique not to be 
nervous, or you learned a way of adjusting your self-concept so that everybody who gets on stage, because we all get on stage and we think, you know, why would they ever invite me to be on stage? I, I, unless we're experienced. But when you first start doing that, it's like, oh God, I pulled the wool over their eye. They don't realize what a loser I am. But if you found a way to do that, then you can, you can convey that to the people, follow, your followers, the people listening to this or whatever it might be. So it might be that the aftermath was a year later, you, you got a letter or you happened to run into her at some event and she walked up and say, you, you interviewed me. That was one of the best interviews I ever got. Or you could say the next time, the next guest I had six months later, was you know Jimmy Carter or or whoever and I was actually not nearly as nervous with him because of what I'd gone through with that person so that's the aftermath is what is the long-term effect of you having found the courage and the uh and the skill and perseverance to achieve that goal Mm, the now, and now it practically writes itself, doesn't it, George? <laughs> <laughs> That's fabulous. Yes. And, and uh, uh, Michael, you mentioned uh, the six steps. Let's quickly mention them for our listeners in case they didn't catch them. And at the same time, I'll remind them uh, that you have a, uh, um, uh, a, a chart, a one page uh, six step chart to help people write and tell their stories and they can find that chart at your website which is storymastery.com and those six steps very quickly michael what were they i'm sorry uh, but that's my website so you can go to storymastery.com and see all kinds of articles about storytelling and so on but if you'd like to get your own copy to download of this chart uh, that george is talking about go to storymastery.com slash uh, success, right? I, 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 I want to make sure I'm right because I screwed this up. And Nevada, who basically runs my company, she'll get so upset if I don't remember right. But if you just put slash success, then you just go there, we'll ask for your email, and then it'll download for you. So, and that will, it's not just a chart of the six steps, but it explains briefly what it is. And then of course, you want much longer explanation, you could get a copy of the book and so on. But the six steps are these, just very quickly. Step one is the setup, where you introduce us to the hero living his everyday life before anything extraordinary happens. Number two is the crisis, that's the the event that created the problem. Even if it was a good event, I got a new job. The problem is how am I gonna function in this new job? And in response to that crisis, you're gonna figure out, okay, what am I have to do, what so on. And it's in that step that you would formulate the specific visible goal that you wanna achieve. And by visible, I mean, we can envision what it looks like. Step three and four are pursuit and conflict. That's just what are the steps you took to achieve the goal and what obstacles did you have to overcome? And how did you overcome those? And step five is the climax that I just, it's the moment of victory, which is when I was uh, uh, coaching you, George, it was, let's find that moment. So it's very clear that what you got what you wanted. Okay. And, uh, and then the last one is the aftermath, which I just talked about. And by the way, if you go the next time you see, you know, you go to Netflix or Disney Plus or whichever, whichever one you're subscribing to, the next time you watch a Hollywood movie, I guarantee you're going to see those six steps. Mm. Michael, um, when you worked with Will Smith, he came to you for your help. I'm curious what if you if you're able to share what was the most valuable advice that you gave him that he found that was helpful for him? Well, that's <laughs> okay. Let, let's see. That's a tough one because I, I, uh, about the time I worked on the first, the first time I met Will 
not in person, but on the phone was he was shooting I Am Legend. And he had seen a video I did called The Hero's Two Journeys. And so he got somebody to call me and see what I'd be willing to, to look at it. And then we had a conversation. But uh, uh, shortly after, uh, and, I, and I also did uh, Hancock, but after uh, a little bit after that, I was put on retainer by his company. So I actually, you know, was consulted on, you know, probably 10 different movies he made and a number of other scripts that the company was making that weren't designed to star him. So let me see. I'll tell you what I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to not, it, it may, it's factual and true. It's not quite the thing. Here is why he mostly wanted to call me in the first place and what he really, I think, looked to me for. And that is on this video, I said, The Hero's Two Journeys, which I talk about, not the video, but the, 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 the idea of the inner journey of the character and the outer journey. When he saw that, what he really responded to was this idea that while a hero is trying to accomplish things, that's the visible journey, underneath that is a journey of transformation where the hero goes from living in what I call their identity. That's the false self we present to the world. That's the emotional armor we wear to, to keep us protected. Uh, just, just to segue into your story. Now, we didn't get into what exactly was the source of your fear, but chances are what you had been doing because of your fear that you weren't good enough or didn't have status or wherever that came from, probably your identity was in some way you weren't stepping up with all your power in that situation. So you were presenting yourself to the world as just sort of, you know, I, I'm, I'm being extreme and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm just this, I'm just this little radio host in this station. And I, you know, I'm no Larry King or I'm no whoever, Phil Donahue, I'm trying to think who it might've been in those days. Okay. So the idea that we have this emotional armor, this comfort zone we create, and that the way we, what we have to do to achieve what we really want and be fulfilled is let go of that and live in what I call our essence, our truth. And that was what he really responded to that made him want to call me and work with me and continue. And I think that's, I, it, it isn't exactly specific advice. It's always, always, I was pushing to let's go deeper into these characters. Let's not just, you know, we can come up with plot and I, I, you know, I worked with him or the team on that, but it's always like, what's really going on? What's this character afraid of? What does this character really want? What, how are they hiding? And that would be the thing I think he kept wanting from me and, and I kept sort of connecting with him on. My guest today is Michael Haig. Reminding us that stories persuade because they create an emotional experience for your listeners or readers. If you like what you heard, remember to like, comment, and share this podcast. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you convey your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok.